Payton. This is Jared. And this is Good Talk. Good Talk is where we interview people who make games, design games. And pretty much anyone who likes games. Yeah. And today we're interviewing McKay Anderson with the Board Game Critic. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. I have a question Good. for you. All um, right. In your videos, you say Pip. Like you review games and say Pip? What's a Pip? Yep. So a pip is the little dot on a dice. So um, I rate games uh, based on the six sides of a D6. So every pip is a good thing. So I give one pip for every good thing that I can think about in the game. So um, I usually start with three basic pips, and then sometimes I'll give more on top of that. Would it be like the sides of dice for like a 20-sided dice? It would be a 20 pip or just what? How many dots are on the dice, or what? So the I rate dice based is. on a. So I rate based on a d6. So if it gets all six pips, then it has all six sides of the dice, and it's the best game. So my best rating is a six pip. You did that for Wingspan. Yes, I love Wingspan. We have it, and I think it's a really fun game. It's yeah, you guys right, play it. It's mm-hmm. right behind us. We don't have the European expansion, though, but I see it right above you. Yes, it is. It's right on my top shelf. I love I love uh, Wingspan. It's. I think the European expansion is great. I don't think it's necessary. The game's still great without it, but a uh, phenomenal game. And you said Scythe was pit five? Um, yes. So, well, I think. I can't remember what I gave Scythe, actually. What happens if the pip goes above six? Like, what happens if it has so many good things that it goes above six? Someday I may have to expand to, like, a 20-sided dice and do 20 pips, but I haven't gotten there yet. So kind of like how something is out of five stars a lot of times, and five stars being your best, um, I just make six the best. So I'll talk about more, like, other really good things about it, but I usually don't go above six. But that's a really interesting idea. Maybe I should consider that. Yeah, maybe you could do, like, if it goes to, like, 12, instead of having Mm -hmm. a 12-sided dice, you could just have two dice. That's true. I could also just rate it one rating, and it's, like, the I award it by the dice. So it's a D4 game, a D6 game, a D10 game, or whatever. Just uh, name the dice instead of the sides of the dice, which would be cool. Actually, if I were you, I would would do Wingspan a 20 but it yeah. doesn't have 20 things in it. <laughs> but it's still really fun. Except, I like the artwork. Except for eggs. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I love the eggs. The Stonemeyer Games always does a really good job with their components and making sure that they all look really pretty. Mm-hmm. I actually started a new bracket. This uh, I, I think I started it yesterday. And the theme is the best artwork. So, And I think Wingspan was the mm-hmm. very first one that was entered. Mm-hmm. So it's funny that you mentioned the artwork. I just really like the artwork. I like how it looks like a book that you look in to find out where birds are, and it's actually telling you where bo- where birds are in it. Yeah. How, how many games entered in it? So I enter 16 games in each bracket. So it's the first 16 people that speak up and nominate uh, their games. So uh, we just got the 16th sometime while I was asleep, I think. <laughs> I started it right before I went to bed, and then um, we got the 16 entries sometime during the night. While we were interviewing Jamie Jamie Stegmeier, uh-huh. um, he was talking about Clank, and I see Clank right by you. Yes. What do you want to know about Clank? We actually are on like the third, um, our third round of it. So this is Clank Legacy. Have you guys played Legacy games much? Um, no. no, I don't. So think Legacy we have game. Any. Yeah, a legacy game, they're they're usually they're usually pretty expensive, but you usually play through them and the game actually changes. So last night actually, here I'll grab a couple of the cards. I actually have them here because I was gonna take a picture. You actually like tear up cards and like cut things up throughout the course of the game. Um I think we tore up a total of thirteen to fourteen cards um in our game last night, and I'm still they, not used to it. Can they be put back together? 
No, it's just the game is permanently altered while you play it. So throughout like the different rounds of the game that you play, you tear stuff up, you write on cards, you write on the board, you put stickers places, and the game is just always different after that. So me and my sister both bought uh, Clank Legacy at the same time. And so by the time we're done, we'll have two completely different game boards. Um, the game will and still be playable, but because of how we've written on things and put stickers different places, we'll both have two different games, which is kind of a fun idea. Unless one of, unless both of you do the exact same ideas on it, then right. you have both of the same games. But that's right. actually kind of impossible. Unless you <laughs> tell them what unlikely. you're going to do. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of fun. I mean, we could play her game and we could play my game and we both know how to play them, but they're slightly different. The cards in them are a little bit different. The places on the maps are a little bit different. Um, it's a pretty interesting idea. I also got Charter Stone, um, also from Stonemeyer Games over here that's uh, still unopened. Um, but it's another legacy game that has stickers that you put all over the place and uh, it's really fascinating. What is Clank about? Clank is really interesting. So this one is Acquisitions Incorporated. So it's a little bit different. Um, if you know much about Acquisitions Incorporated, I believe they're a YouTube channel that does Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Um, but Clank, the name of it's pretty interesting. Um, throughout the game, there's, uh, at least in this one, it's a dragon that you're trying not to alert. So you're going about the land, collecting artifacts and different things that give you points. Um, but every time you make a mistake, every time you stumble or make noise, that's what's called a clank. So you make like a clank noise. And that puts a little cube into a bag. And then when the dragon comes, he'll attack whoever has the most, whoever's made the most noise. So you reach into a bag and you draw out a few cubes and he'll attack whoever's cubes he draw, draws out. So you're playing the game trying not to make much noise or to alert the dragon too much. It's kind of a fun idea. It's a little bit of a bag builder. Uh, but mostly it's a deck building game where you're buying more cards. But it's a legacy game? Yeah, so this one's a legacy game. Uh, this is Clank Legacy um, that I have, but there's also a normal Clank version, um, and it has several expansions that you can get as well. I definitely recommend it. It's a pretty fun game. But a question I have about legacy games where you tear uh -huh. the cards, are they yeah. easy to tear or do you have to like pull really hard? So they're easy to tear. Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder than a piece of paper, um, but there are also pieces like, uh, you know, like little uh, chips like uh, that you would use for money and stuff. I'm trying to think of a game. Oh, like the, res like the resource coins in Wingspan, oh, um, yeah. like the caterpillars and that. They even have some of those that you're supposed to destroy. So we had to pull out some scissors and like cut through those last night. It sounds like with the cardboard, with the cardboard coins, that would be mm -hmm. harder to tear, unless yeah. you had like, unless you had like sh super sharp fingernails. But <laughs> right. it would still be pretty hard. We were joking with uh, they told a specific person to destroy it, and he was like, "How do I destroy this?" And I said, "You have to suck on it for the rest of the game until it gets soft enough to <laughs> tear up or chew up." <laughs> but he just went and got some scissors. It was kind of boring. I actually have a question for you guys, if um, if you don't mind. Okay. So I was working, so I've worked for Hasbro in the past, uh, designing board games. I worked on a bunch of different monopolies and stuff. But when I worked for Hasbro, I got the same question over and over again that people would ask me, and I didn't really know how to answer it, so I'm hoping you can help me out. Um, they would say, board games, are people still playing board games? They're like, haven't like video games kind of just like taken over? Like, are there really people who are really buying and playing board games? Yes. And I didn't know how to answer them. <laughs> well, I knew that the answer was yes. Um, but do you guys think that board games will eventually just be like phased out by video games? Are video games that much better that they'll replace board games at some point? Well, board games are really fun, but so are video games. I just feel like they might... Video games can go on for a longer time than board games, but board games, I think, are more fun than video games because you can play them more as a family. They okay. might make other games, like they have, we have a game that has a CD in it, so it's partially, so it's like a video game board game. Yeah, it's called um, Pokemon Champion Island. 
That's it's actually like, my yeah. favorite. Yeah, but it's like it's got a board that you like roll the dice and move your pieces on, and then whatever you land on, on the screen you like push on a challenge that you landed on. Like okay. Pokemon Center, you get to roll the dice again. Pokeball, you get to get a Pokemon. Uh, the R is Team Rocket. So mm. if they'll like, if you have like. They'll ask you like, do you have, do you have two? If you have two electric types, then you don't have, then you can stay there. But if you don't, then you go to the nearest Pokemon Center. Mm-hmm. Nice. That sounds awesome. I love Pokemon, by the way. I think yeah. you guys know that. I sent you those stickers, which I hope I hope you like. <laughs> the skull stickers. Yeah, the skull we- ones. We, we put- actually put them on our Pokemon card holders. Mm-hmm. Nice. Do you guys play Pokemon a lot? Um, kind of. Kind of. We play Pokemon cards a few times, and a few times we play Pokemon Champion Island, but we like yeah. playing games as a family. Nice. Um, we have, I think, over 100 Pokemon cards. Over 150. Oh. We have... Do you, do you have think, a favorite Pokemon? I think we have mostly mm-hmm. water types. Yeah. I think my favorite Pokemon is Litten. Mine is Poplio. Do you know who Litten and Poplio are? I don't. So I grew up back with the original 150. (laughs) And so I know, I know a little bit from, um, from the original, like red and blue. Then I know some, I think up through Ruby and Sapphire editions, um, but more of the recent ones. I really don't know them very well, so I have some I have some homework to do. Well, there is over seven hundred. Yeah, there's over seven hundred Pokemon now. That's crazy. I was actually living in Japan when they released uh, Black and White, uh, the Black and White video games, um, and they did this really cool thing where you could go around to Seven Elevens and collect uh, stamps uh, from 7-11s? different Seven Elevens. Yeah, like oh, the, the, uh, the gas like the gas station. Yeah, like okay. the they're they're called convenience. They're convenience stores. Um, but I remember standing in line. I was uh, twenty years old, and I was standing in line with a bunch of little like six and seven year olds to get my stamp on my little uh, collector card because I wanted the. It came with like a big poster of all the Pokemon organized by like their weight, which I thought was really sweet. Yeah, one uh-huh. of the sillier things I've done. We've actually watched someone play um, Pokemon Shield. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Pokemon mm-hmm. Sword and Shield. I've heard really good things about it. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, um, the person who we watched play, she found, like, a laser going up into the sky. It was actually just a, like, a cabin. No, a campsite. But oh, really? I don't know why, but they were camping in the morning. Oh, nice. So I actually have a, I have a five-year-old. So this, uh, did you, what was the name of the Pokemon game that you said? Because okay. I think you Shield. might really like that. Sword and Shield. No, the board game one that you played. Oh, Pokemon Champion Island. Champion Island. I'm going to write that down. Because are there any other games? Um, my five-year-old really likes games. But he's just on the edge, like he can't really read yet. And so he's just on the edge of being able to play a lot of the games that we have. Are there any that you would recommend that you think he might be able to play? Mm, Um, Pokemon cards. He would probably be able to play Pokemon cards. mm -hmm. Because there's not much reading. You just have to know what the powers do. That's true, and he's good at numbers. It's mostly just that it's mostly just it just said what they're called, what the powers are, which that doesn't have to do anything with how you play. Yeah, and Pokemon Champion Island has just the names. And the screen tells you, like, there's like a narrator that tells you what everything says. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for Team Rocket, it's just them saying it. Um, Okay, cool. Yeah, it's in the school know, room. I'm looking for something else. He said to recommend. Um, cloak cats. He could play. Yeah, cloak cats doesn't have too much reading. And then probably um, 
Oh, Rhino Hero. Rhino Hero. He could play. Yeah, oh, Rhino Hero I and Rhino Hero are super bad. Oh. Rhino Hero is right <laughs> there. And then he could play Five Minute Dungeon. There's oh, a five okay. There's a oh, Five Minute Dungeon app that says Well Astro Yeah, Astro Trash. Astro Trash. Mm-hmm. Astro Trash. I've seen you guys playing that one before. You like that one? Valley of the Vikings. Yeah, because there's no cards. Not that. But Aquazu. Um, Aquazu is a game that doesn't have too much reading. Oh. Yeah. I know. Talk. Tacos versus burritos. It only says what the cards, what the food is. It has. It on the corners it says how much points it gives you, and then it says what the food is. But you oh, don't okay. need to know that. Yeah, the food is just like a bunch of weird stuff. Okay. Like you guys, um, sunfish. Yeah, there's a sun. There's a fish a head sunfish, in it. Huh? <laughs> a yeah, sunfish. Yeah, there's also a taco cake. Ooh. In a taco or a burrito. It's a taco cake, as in the shoe cake. Yeah, the, oh. the shoe choco in a cake. I can tell why there's a health inspector because pretty much nothing in that is healthy. Yeah, there's a health yeah. inspector that there's a health inspector that takes away all the food. So okay. I feel like everything in there is unhealthy, and the health inspector would just take all of it away. I think actually, is hot sauce healthy? Um, it's not unhealthy. <laughs> So pretty much the only thing that's healthy is hot sauce. Not, I just said it's not <laughs> unhealthy, but it's not necessarily healthy. But I don't think they take it. They do. Huh. They take away everything in your taco. But not your taco. Um, so in this game, are you putting everything into the tacos? Mm-hmm. You want to get points. Yeah, but you also have the, okay. these, like you have these cards that... They're tummy aches, so you can put them in other people's card, in other people's tacos or burritos to there's, take away points. There's even oh. no bueno. That means that means n- you can't do that. And then someone can do another no bueno on that to make it a C bueno. But then if someone does a third no bueno, then it's back to a no bueno. It just keeps <laughs> going. Bueno. That's awesome. Uh, it's no bueno. <laughs> I think bueno is great. What was the first game you made? The first game I made. Oh, geez. So when I, well, when I was going to college, I remember hearing about Kickstarter. This was when Kickstarter was pretty new. And I was going to school to be an industrial designer. And uh, Kickstarter is actually pretty important in the industrial design world because that's how a lot of things get made. Um, so I was like, I don't really understand how Kickstarter works. And so I decided the best way to figure out how Kickstarter works is to put something on Kickstarter and see if it, uh, see if I can get it funded. And so I, I was working in a place that has a laser engraver. And so I asked them if I could rent their laser engraver to, uh, engrave dice. So I ordered a whole bunch of dice from China and I started engraving on these dice and I made a series of games that I called Black Rabbit Dice. And they're actually to help kids develop their uh, speech and critical thinking. So I worked with, um, with a speech pathologist to uh, help understand how I could get kids to use words and to speak uh, more clearly using these little dice games. So they're dice with little uh, pictures on them and you roll them. And there's a bunch of different games that you can play based on um, how much the kids need to uh, develop certain parts of their speech. I hope it, that made sense. <laughs> a yeah, lot of big words there. it kind of does. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it went really well um, on Kickstarter. I think I set the goal for like $500. I think we ended up with $18,000. Um, I ended up shipping to like eight different countries, I think. And it was really fun. But I spent, I think, over 52 hours um, on the laser. And I had to do it when 
um, when the office wasn't open. So I would get up at like uh, one in the morning and I would go and I would start lasering stuff and I would go all the way till eight o'clock in the morning when I would start working there. Then I would stop and just start working. Um, and I did that for about a month just so that I could fill all of these orders. I was super inexperienced and did not expect to be doing that much work for this Kickstarter thing. Um, but it was a really, really fun process. Yeah, wow. but from needing like five hundred dollars, like fifty hours. Yeah, but was a lot. from but from needing five hundred dollars to do a game and getting eighteen thousand. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. I just so think I remember. That, oh. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just think that's really crazy. That means you can make like uh more than 18 games. Yeah, it was it was a ton. I I can't remember the number of dice that I ordered, but I had just a room like the corner was just full of floor to ceiling with boxes of just blank dice and I still have a big bag that I still use for game design whenever I need dice. Um, I'll pull out some of those blank dice and just draw on them with Sharpie so that I have uh, something that I can use. Hmm. But I just calculated and found out it was 36 games. If you needed $500 for one game you can, and you got 18000 it would be 36. <laughs> I didn't need 500 for one game. I needed 500 to make sure it was worth ordering a ton of dice from China. Oh. But... Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, I think that I was selling the dice for like fifteen dollars a set. Um, what's your favorite game theme? Wait, no. Favorite game theme? That is a great game question. Game theme. Um, so I have. Ooh, I really like pirates, and I'm not exactly sure why because I don't even have that many pirate games that I like. I like Pirate's Cove. Um, if you've never played that one, it's a really fun one. Um, yeah, I don't even have that many pirate games, but I just like the idea of pirates uh, being out on the water and stuff like that. I don't know. I think maybe if you like pirates, Valley of the Vikings is a really fun family game. Yeah? It's kind of pirate, but it's more Vikings falling can be pirate. into the water. <laughs> more Vikings. Nice. We're falling into the water and Viking, but there is no dragon. There's no dragon, just, that's fine. There's just hitting giant barrels at other barrels that are team barrels. I think of it as the other players are in barrels. Okay. Other players are in the barrels and the other barrel like breaks their barrel. That's a lot of barrel. <laughs> that sounds like, awesome. Mm-hmm. But you don't actually break the barrels. You just try hitting the barrel to knock down other players' barrels. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, one barrel would hit the other. There's four. You don't want to hit your barrel. Because if you fall in the water, then you go back to the starting. And if someone ends the round and you're at the starting, you get nothing. Oh, okay. And people can steal from you, and you don't get anything. Why is your YouTube channel called The Board Game Critic? You have a bunch of other options other than that. Why did you decide on The Board Game Critic? It's a good question. So when I was thinking about what... So I a long time ago, before I worked at Hasbro, I had a website called The List of Board Games. Now, I think Board Game Geek existed at that time, but I didn't know about it. And I was like, I just want a list of every board game. I think I was really young and dumb because I didn't, I thought that like, that was a pretty short list. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I can just like make a list of all the board games in the entire world. So I started my own website and it was just kind of for me so that I could just start listing every board game I ever heard of. And then I started writing my thoughts about them. And then it actually turned into a website where I was, kind of critiquing games and then Rio Grande games started sending me games to review and it just kind of turned into this thing that I didn't even know um, 
I could do, which was reviewing board games. And then I had to shut down that website when I went to work for Hasbro. Um, and then when I stopped working for Hasbro, I was like, you know what? I want to start up a website again. And I really like complaining about things. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but I like to complain and I like to figure out things that are wrong. And that's, that's why I did well at Hasbro because people would bring me their games and they'd say like, okay, here's the game, like play it and find what's wrong with it. So that was kind of my job at Hasbro um, is I would, sometimes I would think up new games, but for the most part, I would take a game and I would play it and I would figure out what was wrong. And so I had to be really critical and really, um, I would have to complain about all the parts of the game that I didn't like and figure out ways to fix them. So when I started the Board Game Critic, that was kind of my mission, was to say what was wrong with all of the board games. But the more I play board games, I'm like, I honestly really like most board games. I actually don't have as much to complain about as I thought I did. So that's where I kind of, I'm still a board game critic. I still like to talk about what's good about them and what's bad about them. But I actually found out that I'm just more of like a board game partier. I just like board games. I, yeah, I think it's hard a, to find something you don't like about board games. I think right. a better way to make the list is make a list of your board games. So you, so you already have a list of board games that aren't even made yet. Yeah, that's a good idea. I do have a ton. I do have a big list of the board games that I have. And I have two that I'm working on designing right now. I hope they'll be on Kickstarter later this year um, if everything goes well. Are you able to tell us about them? Yeah, I can tell you about them. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the theme. Um, and I'll apologize. My my sense of humor is a little bit dark. <laughs> I, I think some things that are kind of sad and unfortunate are actually kind of funny sometimes. So bear with me. Um, in game number one, you're a group of um, firefighters that's trying to keep the forest from burning down. But while the forest is burning down, you can also like chop down trees and sell them to logging companies for money. Um, but if you do it too much, then you'll get fined and it'll cost you victory points in the end. Um, it's a fun, it's kind of cooperative because you're trying to keep the forest from burning down, but you're trying to chop down as many trees um, without the other players really. And get the most points. It. Yep, and get the most points. That reminds me of another game we have called the Mansky Caper. You're trying to, like, go to a place and get the most gems, but you have to work together. So I like, call okay. it a co-op, non-co-op game. It's like nice. the, um, in the uh, rules is actually a comic book. And Buzz oh, said fun. that they said, let's, let's go get the money and we can kind of both, all get the same amount of money and then it, it made it so all of them said i think i'll get more yeah they were all saying but a bit more for me like yeah. they were all just thinking that after okay. they all agreed they'd get the same amount of money <laughs> nice so i, I like, love that idea i love the comic at the first of the game story is really important to me when it comes to a game i love reading that beginning part of a game where it talks about like the story of what's happening Mm -hmm. That reminds me of actually another game. It's uh -huh. a fireside game. It's like you, your firefighters putting out the fire in the forest. Um, it's called um, what? It's called Hot, Hot Shots. Oh yeah, I've heard of Hot Shots. That is a good one. There are a lot of fire it? games. <laughs> I don't have it, but I've uh, I've seen. It. I've looked it up several. Do you times. have any fireside games? I don't think so. I'm trying to think if I have any. I've played like Flashpoint, which is a good like a burning building one if you guys have played that. Do you have um, Castle Panic? No, but I've played it. Hmm. So like you've played um, at a friend's house or something? Yeah, well, I actually played it at Hasbro. Um, one really fun part of working at a board game company is you just need to know games that are out there so that you don't make something too similar or too... Um, or you just need to know kind of like the variety of games that are out there. So we would just like buy a whole bunch of games, play through them, and then send them home with people and stuff. So that was a really fun part. 
Hmm. Um, the other game that I'm in the middle of designing is it's a roll and write game. And the story is um, everybody has these little baby monsters that they've hidden in the sewers underneath New York. And um, you're trying to feed them to get them to grow. But the more they grow, you kind of lose control of them and they just start eating people around the city. So you get, you get more points for like the more important people that they eat, if they eat like the governor or if they eat like a lawyer or a scientist or an electrician or something. They do different things depending on what the monsters eat, but you can't really control who they eat. There are these uh, monsters that have kind of gotten out of control. Is it, right, then, is it possible for them to eat you? No, it is possible for them to eat each other though. You have four little monsters and they can, if you, if they find each other in the pipes, then they fight each other um, and they hurt each other. What okay. if it, two eat each other? What if two beat each other at the same time? Then you lose a lot of points. Every time a monster gets injured, you lose some points. Mm. But um, is it like, how many, what if there is no good people left in the game is the game over so the game ends when uh, police find your monsters and take them away so as soon as somebody alerts the police too many times so if you eat certain people some people the police don't care as much about and they don't come looking for them as much but some really important people the police will look for harder so the more important people you eat the more uh, you risk being found by the police. And as soon as one person gets found by the police, then the game ends and everyone totals up their score. What if everyone has the same amount of scoring? Like, so it if... hasn't happened yet, but I think if, if, if people end up with the same score, then it'll be the person with the biggest, most impressive monster. Ah, oh. what if they have the same monster? they have the exact same monster, then I think it's gonna go down to who's alerted the police the least. I hope it doesn't ever have to get that far as far as ties And go. probably if it's that, just you tie. Yeah. <laughs> like if you alert the same amount of police, then you just tie. Yeah, if you tie it in three different else. categories, yeah, then. It's hard to find them. anything else to see who's the winner. Or if you want, yeah. you can just do, or you can just tie. That yeah. would be easier because you wouldn't have to count. You wouldn't have to count all those point things. What advice do you have for people that are making games and don't really know how to make the type of games that you make? Like people who are just starting to make games. That's a great question. Um, one thing that I always advise people on when they're thinking through like how their game works and stuff it, um, I usually have two things that I want to make sure they do. First is to think about what you want the people who are playing the game to feel. Because at the end of the day, that's really why we play board games, is to experience some kind of feeling, right? It's whether it's being with people, if it's a cooperative game, it's about winning together. If it's um, a game where you're kind of pushing your luck, uh, like Farkle or something like that, it's that like anxiety. Have you played Farkle? No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's a game where you can keep rolling as much as you want, but as soon as you roll something specific, you lose all of the points that you got. So you need to decide when you're going to stop. It's uh, like a push your luck game. But what you feel in that one is kind of this like scared, like, oh, should I do it again? And so I, I always tell people to first focus on like what you want the feeling of the game to be. If you can really make people feel something, then they're going to come back and they're going to keep playing your game. And then the second thing that I always tell people to make sure and think about is, um, oh shoot, I just, it just fled me. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to me sometimes too. Like I'm just about right. to say something and then it's just like, poof, it just goes right. away. I'm working. Oh, I remember now. Okay. So okay. the, the second thing that I always tell people is to simplify the rule set. It's easy to make a game that has like rules on top of rules on top of rules because then you just keep, when you run into a problem and it's like, oh no, but if we do this, then nobody wins the game. Then it's like, oh, just add in another rule. It's always better to 
strip a rule out and like take a rule out of the game to make it more simple than it is to add another rule on top of it just because it makes the game more and more complex. So those are kind of the two things that I recommend to people when they're designing a board game is think about what you're wanting them to feel and design it in the simplest way you can. Do you write the rules for games before or after playtesting? Like, do you write the rules and then you playtest and then add or take away whatever you need to? That's a good question. So they usually kind of happen together. So I usually will start, I usually play the first round of playtesting just by myself. I usually set it up for a couple different people and then I play all the different people. That helps me get out like really big issues like, oh shoot, I can see that the game is never going to end with the way, like the way I thought it was. And so that'll help me get rid of big questions. Um, but usually I will write down the rules, um, just really rough, I call them rough rules. Um, and that will help me kind of get the general feel of the game. And then I have like my starting uh, kind of document of rules that I can update if I need to. But what if it's like a game that you can't see the other people setting? How that way, so if it's like a hidden information game that it would uh, be ruined if I saw their cards? Then yeah. you would just play. I would definitely them. have to start with people. Mm -hmm. You could start with, like, two people if, like, if it was a one-player game, then that means you could see the other people's cards. Yeah. Right. Unless it's, like, the other people were, like, monster things. Yeah. But then it would need to be a two-player game. Like, one good yeah. guy against three bad guys. Yeah, every game is a little bit different. You kind of need to plan like how you're going to test the game uh, a little ways before you actually start. This isn't related to games, but I just really want to ask it. Do you like reading books? I do. I love, I love books. Um, ever since I've gotten to like my 20s, Books put me to sleep, like, instantly. I can be wide awake, I'll pick up a book and start reading, and I'll be asleep in a couple minutes. So what I do more now is I listen to a lot of audiobooks um, while I'm in the car and doing stuff like that. That's exactly like him. He has to read it if he, he like, won't sleep unless he reads. Yeah, like, really? if, for, for a while I've been getting really tired if I read books books or have anything to do with paperwork but otherwise i'm just wide awake all the time and if i try going yeah. to sleep i stay like i get even more awake yeah that's so a lot easier yeah books are a good time. way yeah books are a great way to put yourself to sleep i don't like it when he does that because he always has his light on Peyton, do you guys share I'm... a room yes mm -hmm. that's fun but we both have our own beds in the walls nice. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's our awesome room is kind of small if you put like if we had the beds just like actually in the room we wouldn't have a lot mm -hmm. of room we would to... only have like two feet but i feel no, like that... two feet well, are they murphy beds that fold out of the wall no they're our dad installed them into the wall mm -hmm. oh nice like that's he sweet. cut out a space into the attic so that he could like put he, our beds in he even cut out shelves for us that's awesome and drawers you guys you guys should do a you should do a thing on instagram where you show your awesome beds that your dad built he seems like a pretty handy guy mm -hmm. he is a builder he's building he, we're helping him build the, our tree house oh i saw that on a video your guys' backyard looks amazing mm-hmm mm -hmm. Did you see that on the fort video in the background? I can't remember, actually. I think I, I saw, I believe there was a garden back there and lots of trees. Mm -hmm. And I saw there was definitely a tree house in the background. But I was like, man, I think I actually messaged your mom and asked, like, where do you guys live? It looks beautiful. We do live in a pretty beautiful place. What's the best thing about working board with board games in your career for a career uh, that's a really great question um i really enjoy all the free board games that i get which is one thing um 
But I think more than that, I really enjoy seeing people enjoy something that I've created. And I really like the idea that I'm helping people step away from TVs and phones and screens and really have meaningful interactions with each other. And I think that's one of the reasons why I tell people to always focus on the emotion of the game, because at the, at the end of the day, what I want to do for work is really to connect with people and make it easier for other people to connect with people around them. And I think that's something that we, that we miss in our world these days. And um, I get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing people get excited or see their eyes light up when they make a certain move and they know that they've just won the game or something like that. Um, we ask a few would you rathers at the end of our interviews. Do you want okay. us to ask you some? Absolutely. That sounds fun. Um, mine is, would you rather have the hiccups all the time? Or have the hot tongue feeling all the time. Oh, jeez. Um, feeling. Like where your tongue is all like... Like when it's spicy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. I, think, I think the burning spicy tongue feeling all the time over hiccups. I, I always feel stupid when I'm trying to say something and I keep hiccuping, if that's the way you say it. Um, so I think I would just rather, cause then I could probably just get used to it and nobody would really know that something's wrong with me. But and you wouldn't eat there. Really? Yeah. It'd be yeah. Eventually it. I think I would be used to it. I would do the, I would do the hiccups. I would do the hiccups cause, um, everyone would know I have the hiccups. Yeah. Um, my would you rather, would you rather live in a world where each word you say will cost you one cent or each step you would take cost 10 cents? Ooh, that's also hard. Um, I would rather live in a world where every word I said would cost me one cent. Then I feel like this would cost about like, (laughs) this This would be an expensive interview. Yeah. <laughs> one dollar. No, no. Yeah, I'm a pretty he I'm a pretty like quiet person. He said like a hundred <laughs> things. Oh, I've definitely said over a hundred words. <laughs> no. Like five dollars. <laughs> no, not five hundred words. Like three hundred and fifty words. This is where you should challenge your dad to count up how many words we've said throughout the course <laughs> of this. <laughs> Uh, that would be mean. Ten, maybe. <laughs> ten words? Or ten uh, hours? Ten cents. Oh, I'm... <laughs> if I'm feeling really ambitious, I'll go back and watch this with a little clicker and count how many words we've said. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions I'll for us? <laughs> that happens sometimes. We talk at the same time. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I have one question for you. One last one. Um, I, so you know about my board game brackets that I do on Instagram. Um, you guys have come in second twice. Um, and I'm wondering what you think my next bracket should be. So we're doing the board game with the best art this time what kind of and we've done the best board game that they're still making that's still in print and then we've done the best card game do you guys have a bracket that you think would be fun to see for bracket number four Mm -hmm. um the best i think how about the i think longest game no the the most games no the longest game like to see which game is the longest okay or just someone or the longest whoever, and most fun game. Or whoever has the most games. Oh, that could be She's fun. She's talking about which game. What? <laughs> oh, Roll and Write, mm-hmm. maybe. Roll Ooh, and Roll and Writes could be a good one. One of them would be um, Railroad Inc. Mm-hmm. We have... Like, yeah. We have... Um... Oh, yeah. Cartographers would be one, too. We have, I think... Ooh, more... oh, no, that's a... We have... That's not Roland. Uh, it's a flip and write. Maybe just the writing games. Yeah, I think they all kind of fall into roll and write. Guess what? I actually bought Railroad Inc. yesterday. So I actually, I bought it yesterday because you guys had talked so much about playing it on 
uh, your Instagram that I was like, oh my gosh, I should, I should get that. And it actually has a message in the cover that's like signed by the game designer, which I didn't even know until I bought it. And they were like, oh yeah, it also has this like signature on the inside. So I was pretty excited about that. It's been a lot of fun interviewing you. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for letting me come on here. It's fun to see you guys and your house and your whole setup. It's uh, I've found so many friends through Instagram and doing all of this board game stuff. And so it's, it's fun to have two new friends. And we're about to have a better setup. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see it. I'll keep my eye out for it. It, you're probably going to know which ones have it and which ones don't because of the picture on the front. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll keep my eyes out. You guys keep playing games, and I'll let you know once I play Railroad Inc., because I just bought it yesterday. Once I play it, I'll let you know how I like it. Okay. I hope we get to interview you again. I well, I would like that a lot. And uh, I'm just telling you this. Railroad Inc. is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm looking forward to it. I think you're going to like it. Bye. Bye. Okay, see you guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Kid Talk. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. See you later. Bye.